Hello, beautiful listeners. It's your host, Tembi Locke. Welcome to Lifted, a podcast that pulls back the curtain on creativity, resilience, and the extraordinary moments when everything changes. Laura Fox is an Emmy-nominated production designer with over 25 years of experience in film, television, music videos, and commercial work. Her projects include The White Lotus, The Eyes of Tammy Faye, and the Golden Globe-nominated 500 Days of Summer, as well as many, many more. I first met Laura working on From Scratch. Instantly, I knew she was, yes, a gifted and respected production designer. But she was also one hell of a human with a giant heart and deep reservoirs of creativity. I wanted to pick her brain, be her best friend, join her for holidays with her family. So this conversation is my way of better understanding her, getting to know her, what captivates her, what inspires her as she transforms ideas into space. Well, hi, Laura Fox. Welcome to the Lifted Podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. I'm so happy to be here and to see your beautiful face, Tembi. Oh my gosh. So first of all, I would be remiss if I did not say, congratulations. Just yesterday, you were nominated for an Emmy for the White Lotus. I was shocked. (laughs) It was so funny. My decorator and my art director sent me text saying, we got nominated. I'm like, oh, and I write the director, congratulations, and go about my day. Hours later, these calls are coming in. I'm like, it's not that big a deal. I mean, it's a successful show. And then I finally realized that myself and my team had been nominated. I'm super proud and excited, obviously. Yes. And the show is amazing. And what you did on that set is amazing. So we will talk about your work. And I'm so happy to be here to do that. And maybe that's a great way to begin because some of people listening may not even know what your work is <laughs> as a production designer and like what that is. And so if you had to just, in a sentence, describe what you do, like if you met somebody at a dinner party, they'd be like, what do you do? What do you say typically? <laughs> <laughs> One sentence you say. Okay, two, three, four, five, whatever. It doesn't matter. You know, I work with the director and my great team of artists to figure out the look of the film and how we're going to achieve it and how we're going to best help tell the story, create a world that helps you understand the characters and what's going on. And honestly, as I always say to my art director, who's telling me the life lessons we learned on any job. Every job is different. One of the things that I love so about production design, just, you know, so having spent years as an actor, I would read these scripts, right? As my guest star on whatever show, sitcom, film, whatever. And I'd be like, okay, I kind of know, I get a feel. And then that day comes, you're in costume it's, and you walk onto set and you're like, this is the playground. Now I'm in the world, right? And early in my career, I was like, who does this? Like, who is the person who figures out that book should be on the shelf in this scene? Because as an actor, I could use those things to fill out the world, right? And of course, over many years, I learned, okay, that person (laughs) is the production designer. And in the case of Laura Fox is a genius at what she does, truly. You build up this world. You get a script and I'm curious about this process. You know, you read it, you sort of break it down. And then you, I'm assuming, imagine a world in your brain, maybe, perhaps. And then you like fill it out. You build it and fill it out with rich emotion. That's the thing about your work. The spaces are so emotional. Again, I'm going to bore you with it. Every job is different, but yet every job has a thread of similarity. Obviously, White Lotus was completely unique because it was in a bubble in a hotel and started with a script and an idea and a color palette. Whereas if I'm doing something that's period, there are piles of research. Yeah, I have a lot of books. I love photography. I don't think I'm the only brain. I think a lot of brains make up great work. I don't ever like to copy, but I love to take a ton of ideas that exude the feeling or the era or the mood. And sometimes they're way off beat, but there's just a glimmer of something that cooking metaphor feeds the stew. And so every job is different. And then you're also trying to help the people that you work for and with. You're trying to help the actors. You're trying to help the director. 
there's always going to be a bit of me in any piece I do, no matter how different, because you can't avoid it if you're really committed and you're passionate. That's what I think makes people good at their jobs, being willing to give a little bit of themselves while trying to take in all the other elements, the script, the director, the actors, even sometimes the parameters that restrict you, money, all those things push you to do better work. It's a big puzzle that you get to put all the pieces together. What could be better? There's so many things I want to talk about about what you just said. And I'm going to circle back to like sort of the elemental parts. But I want to go to this piece about putting yourself into the work. So like, take me back just a little bit. Your formative background, where'd you grow up? Did you live in a house that was rich with books and arts and all the things? Or did you like discover that in the world that, oh, this is this thing for me? Or was there someone who helped you to see, oh, I see the world through art and images? Life is kind of funny because... When I studied theater and was a theater director in college, did a show in Europe and I came back and I had a small daughter at this time. And of course I was totally broke because theater, schmeater. And my brother was a baby production designer at the time. He first hired me to clean his house. I did it so badly and charged him so much that didn't work. Then he hired me to decorate for him, which I had no idea what I was doing. And he was mean and made me cry even though I love him dearly. Oddly enough, we did a job with Francis Lawrence, who wanted to become a huge director. And he called my brother and said, hey, I got this little job. Can I use your sister? And he said, yeah, it was just a little decorating thing. And we never found a location. And somehow I built a ginormous set. And I was like, how am I doing this? What am I doing? I don't get, but I just knew. I look back on, you know, building a junkyard set in college where I drove around picking up trash for months. I still can't pass an old tire without thinking I should put it in my car. And then I go even deeper and I look at my dad, who was a contractor. I'd say, dad, are you religious as a little kid? He'd go, I'm more spiritual. Look at that tree. Look at that. And so I started looking to his eyes. He liked the weirdest, most banal buildings because he'd go, Uh, I like form and function mix. So with no real awareness, I see all these building blocks of my life. Right now, one brother is a production designer. One brother is a prop maker who used to work for me. My other brother is a political scientist. We don't know what happened there. But but there there clearly is a world. I used to hang out on construction sites as this five-year-old in Las Vegas with my dad when he was building an addition to the Flamingo. I think all those things, you don't realize it until much later in your life that they are so informative. I just recently, without even realizing it, during the pandemic, I live on the LA Wash, which is just kind of a deserted area, but my house has access. And every day I would take walks and I started picking up everything, bits of metal, old keys. Suddenly I was finding broken glass, old tiles. And I started making this sculpture on the wash that literally ended up being about 60 feet long of sticks and garbage and rust and all these things. And then one day the city banged up my back window and said, we're taking this away. And I was devastated because it had been my COVID savior. And I'd even invited a young friend who was struggling, who I had photos of her washing glass with me to put in the sculpture. And I collected every bag of what would be another person's trash. And I brought it into my carport get up on a ladder and photograph it, I started seeing these creatures. And I went on to start making creatures from this supposed trash. And then I had about six and I sent them to my daughter in New York. And I'm like, hey, want to write a book? And she came back, we'll need 26. I'm going to do an alphabet book. And then just two months ago, we sent it off to a literary agent who loved it. And just this morning, we finished her notes. I realize it goes back to those damn tires and I just didn't even realize it. And and now after the time of having so much time to do that during COVID, which was a weird, tragic, but also gift to so many in some areas, I'm even more in tune with that part of me. I cannot tell you what a gift talking to you is because you're reminding me and and I hope our listeners as well. First of all, congratulations on the book. Talk about cross collaboration. I mean, I'm hearing collaboration with your sibling, which I know because clearly I work with my sister. Collaboration with your daughter, right? The idea of, oh, I have this whimsical idea. Hey, what do you think if? And I feel like so much of creativity and so much of an artful life and you live an artful life. I mean, you were collecting 
bits of discarded people's trash along the LA basin and built it into a sculpture, which is now a book. Okay, so that should tell you how we can use bits and pieces of anything in our life. And that can be objects, but that can also be experiences. I know that as a writer and you cobble these things together through your lens and your point of view and they become a gift to someone else. And that is an artful, you know, what I call like living a fully embodied artful life. Talk about expansion. So you kind of helped me see the professional steps that led up to your having your first job, like as a production designer and how, you know, your career then continued and expanded. But I'm wondering if there was doubt, that sense of like, okay, can I do this? Is this possible? Am I flying past my skis? Is this too weird and nobody will get it? I mean, I think as creative people, I know for me that when I sat down to write the book from scratch, I thought, who's going to get this? It has life, art, Italy, death, motherhood, grief. Oh, food, there's recipe. I was like, how do I put all of these pieces together into something artful? Honestly, probably every single job, everything I do, because if I don't, then I'm not going to get better. If I don't worry, am I good enough? Can I do this? I started out this weird theater director, you know, leaving that to yay, make some money not deal with actors. Yay. Sorry, Tembi. I love you, but I'm just better without the actors. And in those days, I was building massive sets with guys I just picked off the street. There were no construction coordinator, huge sets, working like 60 hours with a hotel room for a few minutes of sleep and my crew bringing me fresh socks. And suddenly at three in the morning, sweeping the stage to inspire everyone to, we're going to get this done. I always knew I would get everything done because I had to. And so then you learn from that confidence. You're always going to get it done. And then the next goal is, can I get it done well? Can I be better than the last time? Can I meet the needs of this job? Can I deal with this budget? Every job I have that. And now that I'm doing more narrative, you know, the goals, again, the uh, benchmark changes early on. It was like, can I get bigger budgets? Can I do this? And now I just did a $15 million movie that I loved so much. Since then, I haven't read a script as good. So I've turned down, passed on meeting on 20 projects that had huge budgets and small budgets because the storytelling wasn't good enough. So I think the benchmarks are just for me and the fear and I can do it, I can't do it. It's always there, but I have to do it and I have to get it done and I have to do my best. So that is always my safe zone within those doubts. I literally, I didn't. I did, I'll be honest, I knew intellectually that there was problem solving in production the same way, you know, I know intellectually it's hard to do taxes, but I didn't know <laughs> truly that every day you wake up and you go, what 12 things will go wrong before 8 a.m.? <laughs> And we have hours to shoot and what is going to happen. And so you are at the epicenter of those nimble changes that have to happen, right? Can you talk to us about like, give an example of a task or a moment where you thought, okay, this scene's going to go this way, or I've envisioned it this way. And then you get maybe to the location and it's different and you have to pivot quickly. That's a tricky question because of so many young experiences where I was scrambling to like, make sure that that lick or paint was dry and everything was done. I really, to the best of my ability, try to create opportunities when I'm designing or building a set or a location where the director says they're going here. But when I know an actor is going to walk in, they're going to want to go over there because I just know actors. So I always try, if possible, to create a 360 degree world. And Cruz will say to me, the camera will never see it. No one's going to ever see it. I go, I don't care. I'm making a world. I'm creating an environment. I'm giving them opportunity. And if all I see is that corner and that lamp, It's going to be better because all of this is here. So without wasting energy and money and being practical, I still try and create a world that's 100% there and done and shootable and real. I mean, I think COVID, even our show was difficult because everyone kept pushing me for various reasons to make sets bigger. And producers would use COVID and cinematographers would use COVID to make sets bigger so they were easier to shoot. And I'm like, we shoot on locations half this size. I don't want to make this easier. I want to make this doable, but believable. And 
if these people live in a giant house, I'm in a TV show. And so that was a real struggle. And I think we, in the end, found a good compromise. We were able to do everything. Fortunately, I had you and Attica and Nzinga all standing and believing the same. Yes. What you're telling me and what I see, and I think what is so important for creative people to know is you leave everything on the mat. You're like, okay, I'm going to fill in every corner of this to allow for the magic to happen. It was walking down the street in Silver Lake. There's graffiti, there are murals, there's like stencils on the sidewalk. It's an artful, if you will, visual space. And there was something written on the pavement. It had been faded. And so I walked back and I looked at it. And my first glance is it in the pulse of magic. And it gave me chills. And I needed to read that on a specific day in my life to be reminded that I am living in the pulse of magic and to look for that. And what you do on your sets is you give actors and you give your director and your cinematographer, you give them the potentiality for magic everywhere, right? So that if they go left, (laughs) they're going to find something really nice. And that feels cozy, warm, intimate, full, rich, emotional. I totally agree with that. And then if the magic turns out when you are not fighting a bad environment to be a close-up on an actress, I am thrilled because you had the room to do that because you were in a good looking space where the actor could perform and you didn't have to do it. And so you're finding it. And I think that's the key. I love that. I will share just anecdotally. I had an acting teacher tell me once, get to the set early between your rehearsals and shooting. If you're in an interior space, and for me, because I love words and books, she was like, look at the books on the shelf. Take some secret from the book and give it to your character. It'll change how the scene plays. So even if the scene never sees the books, the books are informing the performance. That's the invisible alchemy that is happening and that is at play. And I love that. And I want to use that kind of alchemy to talk about like life. I mean, you know, the show is about all of the elements that come together to make this arc of a life that we see for this character on camera, this family, these people. I think the gift that I hope people will take from the show is knowing that they can use every part of who they are to fully live their lives. You're telling me that you were like, with great intentionality, are kind of already building that out. I didn't know that about you when we, because we'd never, clearly we'd never worked together. I was told Laura Fox is the jam. And when we first met, it was very clear that like, oh my gosh, please. I was like, I hope she wants to do this job. And you did. And my gosh, but you know, I think a lot of listeners listening to the podcast and people who see the show or people who read the book are really asking these kinds of questions about like, life is an uneven experience, (laughs) right? It's the bitter and the sweet. It's the hard and the soft. I just feel like you are rendering that in an artful way for the screen. I try. That's what we all we can do and try. And for this, it was so interesting because I had so much other things that you don't always have. I had your book. I had you. I had your life. I had photos from your life. I got to know you. Besides reading, I hung out with you. We had laughs. Everything that's on the wall there is either a photograph that she took, an artful display or baskets that she painted. The character was an artist as opposed to an actress like you. Everything was eclectic and everything was building their life together. And that was super exciting to try and create. And I never care if anybody sees anything in my sense. I do care that nothing is random. No artwork, no book should just be random. If you can't match books to a character, don't put them in the place because then they probably shouldn't be reading. (laughs) So for me, that was so great to create that house where they live and went through so much joy and pain. It never changed so much that it became dark and somber. There was sadness, but there was always so much noise within the scenes and the acting and the characters of such different worlds coming together that designing that house, I felt like that has to be the rock of these scenes. We have to feel comfortable there, just like everybody that comes in there does, you know? I mean, we also had a little weird gift of the location that we were shooting the exterior. If you remember, our director had lived there when she first moved to LA. So it held all this sentimental value for her. So then rebuilding the interior a little bit bigger on um, stage, the house already had so much love just from all of our energies. I know that sounds corny, but it really was true. 
It is so true. And I'm going to go back a little bit. You talk about the tire story and picking up things and, and sort of following your intuition, these sort of things that seem disparate and random, but I don't know, you follow it. And I will say that early when I was in my twenties and into my thirties and when Sato, my husband, who the character of Lino is based on was ill, I took pictures and I would paint because I was looking for a way to express what was going on. I had no idea what would come of it. It was not with any intent. It was just like, I feel compelled to do this thing right now. And I feel like this is what I need. So to walk into the Hilltop house 20 years later, the set and see a photograph that I had actually taken, that's imbuing, you know, one, we could look at that as like, those are the set Easter eggs which for those who don't know, Easter egg is like a little hidden thing that only the people who create the set or the producers or the writer, some aspect like in Zora's apartment (laughs) above the television on the bookshelf is the actual book my grandmother wrote about my sister and I. So when Attic and I were filming on set, And like, we see it in the background, nobody else knows, but it immediately as creators and as storytellers, it pops your heart open and it anchors and grounds you and reminds you like what we're all doing here. And I'm sure for Nzinga, filming in the space that was modeled after the first house she lived in in LA. And like, we all were doing these things for each other, which was really wonderful. And I hope it comes through on the screen. And I think it comes through on the screen. But I wanted to pivot just for a second because underneath this, you've talked about being a mom, right? And at times being a single mom, one daughter, I have one daughter. And what was that like work life balance like and motherhood life balance? I did not work that much when my daughter Dakota was young. I lived in a little shack in Laurel Canyon where I could walk her up to her little school. When she got older and said I couldn't walk her, I still followed from a hidden distance. I think we all know that one. You know, we had a crazy creative life together. I mean, we would go for one birthday. We went to a thrift store every weekend and bought ball gowns and hats and gloves and then had 15 girls over for the most extraordinary tea party outside with these crazy inexpensive outfits. And we were always doing weird projects. So, of course, you can attest to this more. I mean, she used to tease me saying, look at that bird or look at this or that. It's your mom, whatever. But when you have a child, it doubles how you see things because you're seeing it through new eyes. Now she points out birds to me or things. I'm like, really? Come on. That's my thing. So I didn't work that much, but I was also incredibly fortunate as a single mom. I had split up with my husband who lived in Canada. He's great. We're all a great family. We still spend every holiday together. But I was lucky that my dad was her babysitter. One day they were getting a little bit old. I think she was like in the sixth or seventh grade. They came to me and they said, we prefer when you work. We prefer when you don't cook. We're good. You can work (laughs) because they they had such an adventurous life. They'd go to weird restaurants. He'd take her on adventures. When she was 16, they found her first car, which they secretly test drove and did all this research on some 1970 Volvo. And she loved coming to sets and she loved what I did. And she uh, thought I was cool then, or she still does. And so I was super fortunate to be able to have a slow burn career. I lived next to a great school. I lived in a shack and I was able to slowly build. And so I was very, very fortunate. And I think having a daughter really made me better at my job and my life. I love that you call it a slow burn career. I can relate to that. I wrote my first, I had the idea to write my first book at 45. You know what I mean? Like learn how to produce at like 50, (laughs) you know? So I come to this having been a caregiver because I had those 10 years when I was caring for my late husband and you know, I wasn't doing a lot of stuff out front facing in the world. I was literally the most intimate and immediate thing that I could do was care for him, right? And still try to hold on to some part of me and my creativity. And I think so many people are doing that and looking for artful ways to balance that. I mean, whether you have a illness in your life or not, even if you're just a mom, you're looking for this like balance of how do I hold on to me, express myself while also caring for another person. What I hear in your story is you had help in the form of a great father. I love intergenerational connections like that. I think they are like so rich and wonderful and beautiful. Would you say that growing up with a dad who is a contractor, contractors have to solve problems all the time, right? Would you say your work and your formative years 
that your work has shaped how you meet your life life away from sets, away from production in terms of being able to like pivot or meet change? Because this podcast is about these moments when our life feels like, I don't know. I don't know if I can do this. This feels like this might be too hard or I have to start over. And then somehow through grace, through work, through the alchemy of a good friend, we find a way. And I'm always interested in kind of unpacking that a little bit. You know, that's such a hard question for me. You know, I've always said, I, I learned late in life. I think I have a weird brain. I don't know any other way to say it because I have this weird ability to solve problems. I can say to my crew exactly what a hundred pieces of widow costs. And while they're figuring out the math, I have no idea why I do certain things and been known to be super neglectful of my own personal life. You know, just give me more books. I don't care what my house looks. Da, da, da. Take care of my parents. Now that my dad currently lives in my back house at 98. So the chain never ends. You know, I think I'm more of a person that just reacts and moves through things, reacts and moves through things. Now, admittedly, I've never had like the kind of tragedy in my life that you faced. I've had the ups and downs that you kind of muddle through, you know, and, and bad days and breakups and good days. And my mom recently passed away, but she was 97. So, so I've been more like react, push through, but now I'm finally learning, like reflect and grow a little, Laura, because I had this incredibly rough month, you know, a dog got killed, my mom passed, take a person to rehab. And the day after my mom's world, I thought, is wrong. I have some serious leg pain. And then for the whole first week of prep on my last move, I was like, my mom's arthritis must have jumped into my body as punishment for something. And suddenly I realized I have shingles, which is a stress related thing. And I'm like, Laura, your body is not going to cover for you anymore. Even at this stage of my life, I'm learning that it's great to stop and reflect. That is something I've gotten better at. And I've also recently taken to naked swimming in my pool with the disco light, which I once said, why would you put a disco light? Just put a lovely blue light because I'm a production designer and that's a good aesthetic. And now I watch the colors change. I swim naked and I think at night. And that's actually a new thing for me. <laughs> Isn't that weird? That is the best thing I have heard all week. And now I want a pool and a disco light. And by the way, I think that should be the title of your memoir in some way. <laughs> I'm just saying. You have these ways, whether you consciously know it or not, of like you're finding this sacred space of meditation. Like when you talk about putting that sculpture together along the side of the basin, right? That is a form of meditation. Getting in that pool naked with the lights and just observing that is a form of self-care, whether you call it that or not. I 100% agree. And there are people like me that aren't naturally good at self-care. I take care of myself. You know, I love getting a facial. I love a mani-pedi, all those things. But like meditating, quieting my brain, brutally difficult for me. I have had many wise people tell me at very uh, critical points in my life, you're doing the best you can. And that is all that matters. If you could do better, you would cut yourself some slack. That saved my ass. I can't tell you how many times because I can be more uh, hard on myself, or I think there's a better way that somehow is eluding me and I'm just not doing that better elusive thing. And to be told, no, you are doing the best you can. And if you could do better in this moment, you would. So chill helps me every time. Because the world is so difficult right now for everybody, but you also have to realize your life is relative in your moment. And so you're going to have your bad days, no matter how much you're empathetic or you're suffering with the rest of the world. And so somehow through that constant, like beating myself up backwards and forwards for like feeling bad because I didn't have a good day. I'm not in Ukraine. And to it evolved to being so grateful. And so now I'm finding that I'm fine to be miserable one day because I'm so grateful. Let's pivot a little bit and let's talk about from scratch. Yes. So I know we've talked about the interior sets. I literally will bow down into the end of time for how you created the interior of the Ortolano house. You literally gave me my mother-in-law's house in Sicily and you did it on a soundstage in Los Angeles. And I don't know how you did it, but it is gorgeous. I have been in contact with both some of the actors from Sicily who are in it, but also people in post in Italy who are like, what? It's beautiful. What would you say was like the biggest challenge for you in recreating that space? Well, you, you asked me earlier, like, what are those moments when you say impossible or scary? 
this was the set for me on this project. I'd never done it. It has to be authentic to Italy. It has to be authentic to you. It also had to be cinematic and shootable. I just dug so deep. I watch months worth of pasta Grammys on Instagram, went through your pictures and your bits and your bobs that you got us from Italy to not just use them, but to feel them and to get connected. I pulled so many references. It was insane. And again, some of the references had nothing to do, but one had that little windy staircase that I knew wasn't in the home, but it felt right. And it would add just another layer because you don't want to put actors and a camera in a box. That house was super emotional for me because it meant so much to you and your life. And it just, I, you can hear my voice choking up a little because it just, it was really emotional. And when I knew it was done, like I, this one little thing went in, I think I cried. It was so right that I think when I showed my sister-in-law like a picture from set, she went, oh, I mean, it was that right. Again, in the pulse of magic. That pulse took quite a few beats to get to. (laughs) Well, we get there how we get there. If only it was always a one and done. If only. So I want to talk to you about episode 105, right? Because that is our hilltop house. It's when our two families come together and we see them in this space, this reconciliation episode that we don't know is a reconciliation episode when they come, the stakes are super high. If you haven't watched it, watch it. Or if you're halfway through this, whatever, you know, it's a big episode, right? So you knew that the set you were building was going to people and hold this critical moment for these characters, right? I mean, did you think about that when you were like, tell me like when you were creating that set or thinking about those scenes, what you wanted to do? A hundred percent, I thought about it, but to the point of, I will not make this set too big because they need to be packed in there and they need to be bumping into each other and they need to be finding their spaces. And yet they all kind of need to, again, be comfortable there. And I just love that everybody in that scene is literally on the same voyage and after the same thing, but it's hidden by butchering flour or actually saving him because he really is a good gardener, cooking food that a sick man can't eat, fixing a television, looking for shows, you know, meditating or bringing Kwanzaa ornaments or whatever. It's just so chaotic and everyone's so different, but there's not a second you think anyone would leave. They are there for the same thing. And I wanted to create that place for them to literally just give the actors their due to do their thing and be these wonderful characters surviving. Is there anything that you learned from working on this show and maybe not from scratch, but maybe for another show that you say, ah, I learned something on this show that I'm going to carry forward with me for the rest of my life. I learned from everything because you know, the second you stop learning and you think you know it all, you're just a big old bore. For me, I will probably carry through more emotion in my work. I mean, I always put everything of me in it, but the script needs to be good. It needs to be, and I love a good comedy. Don't get me wrong. And there's a lot of funny stuff in this too, but I think I just learned to like, I don't know, I was just so invested in in the emotions because it was your story. And I want to make sure that I can take that and give it to imaginary characters as well. I love that certainly in the Hilltop House, Amy and Lino's house, tapestry, and there's a lot of texture. And that's the image that came to me as you were talking, literally. And we were all, we talked a lot about like weaving all of these aspects of life together, these different braids and strands and threads and colors and making something beautiful. And then we walk into your set and boom, that's that complexity, right? It's right there on the floor. So this has been such a delight having you here. I am changed for our conversation. You remind me that all of our fun, creative, weird brains <laughs> that are out there that see the world, we have a place, <laughs> right? And I, But also for anyone listening, that you can use all the bits and baubles and make something beautiful. And that's what you do every day. And you do it, I think, in your life. And I know for a fact that you do it on screen. And the Emmys clearly know it too, because you're nominated. Yes. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tambi. I love you. I love you too. (laughs) Bye. Bye. I love what Laura said about finding your safe zone within the doubts. And also about finding art in these unexpected places. That 
is inspiration that lifts me. Lifted is developed, written, and produced by me and my one-woman producing team, Celia Cates. It is edited by Jamie Moss. Thank you for joining us. Stay tuned for our next inspiring episode.